Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm Lucy Hoda, Senior Vice President of Media and Communications for CCA, and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is Compliance with Traced Act, What You Need to Know, and it's sponsored by TNS. And we have two presenters today. First is Lavinia Kennedy, who is Director of Product Management at TNS. Lavinia is responsible for leading the identity and protection product suite at TNS, including Call Guardian, which is a robocall detection solution that uses cross-carrier real-time call events combined with crowdsourced data to allow operators to differentiate legitimate users of communication services from abusive, fraudulent, and unlawful users. Also presenting today is Steve Augustino, who is partner at Kelly Dry and Warren. Steve's Kill telecommunications practice ranges from regulatory, legislative, and administrative law counsel to transactional advice, advocacy, and legislation. Steve's been actively, actively involved in the FCC's multiple proceedings to address unwanted robocalls, and he works with carriers and service providers to understand the FCC's proposals and to mitigate unlawful robocalling. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started here. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them at any time, and we will answer questions at the end. Also, today's webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on the CCA website after it's over. Now, Lavinia, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and, and I would like to thank CCA for, for hosting this webinar. Uh, my name is Lavinia Kennedy, and I have product management responsibilities for the identity and protection um, product suite at TNS. Um, this includes Call Guardian, um, our robocall mitigation um, solution. Um, and today, we, we want to talk to you about compliance with the TRACE Act. Um, you know, what, what do you need to know to comply with the recent FCC orders? Um, the agenda for today includes three items. One is um, Steve Augustino, um, TNS's regulatory um, outside counsel from Kelly Dry, will provide an overview um, of the orders. Um, the second thing we're going to talk about is um, an overview of how TNS um, and, and the tools we developed and deployed in the market today can help you comply. Um, and then lastly, we'll have um, a Q&A um, session. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to Steve for the first item on the agenda, which is the uh, regulatory view of, um, of the orders. Great. Great, and thank you, Lavinia, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, uh, we we appreciate you you coming in. We appreciate CCA for giving us this opportunity. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes walking you through the major requirements from the FCC um, with a focus on stir shaken um, rather than, than some of the other elements. But I want to want to start by level setting this a little bit and and understand that. At the end of last year, Congress passed the Pull Own Soon Traced Act, uh, which does a number of different things, sets up um, over 30 different uh, proceedings or actions that the FCC has to take in the next 18 months to try to address robocalls. Um, and we, we put on this slide here a number of the major things. Um, I'm not really gonna talk today about the right-hand side of this, the consumer protection, uh, call blocking and reasonable analytics elements. I'm not gonna focus a lot on that today. I'm not gonna talk about the strengthening of the enforcement provisions in the Communications Act to deal with um, spoofing and uh, unlawful robocalls. So we can, we can talk about those another day. But the main focus really is on the two things that are on the left-hand side of the screen here. Um, the FCC prior to the TRACED Act included um, a number of measures to address robocalls, from a reassigned number database to uh, addressing the petitions for clarification and declaratory ruling um, and ruling on the, um, the ATDS that's been teed up, uh, those, those types of issues, in addition to dealing with call blocking, dealing with enforcement. But they also started to move along the path of call authentication, which is the stir shaken approach to authenticating calls. And the idea behind the call authentication is that there will be trust in the system again. You will know who the caller is, that caller will be verified in some way. So while the caller still may do bad things and may place illegal calls, 
um, you can identify who that is and the enforcement will be easier. So no more spoofing is sort of the idea behind this. But what the TRACE Act does is it pushes forward on that and told the FCC, you must mandate the stir, shake, and call authentication protocol and must do so within 18 months of passage. Now, the commission did that in an order in March and then in an order um, at uh, the end of September, beginning of October, they fleshed that out just a little bit. So I'm going to talk about those two orders together and what they do. Um, but they set a, I'm sorry, it, we can go just back one more. I want to emphasize, here we go. The compliance date for large carriers for this is 18 months, which is June 30th, 2021. And that covers the IP. We'll go through what it what it is. That's the main thing. But for smaller carriers, um, the FCC has granted an extension. So if you have under 100,000 subscriber lines, across all of the affiliates, there is an extension of two years for this requirement. So while the rest of the industry will be moving forward and calls will be verified, um, your calls are not required to uh, be verified under stir shaken. Um, they will proceed through, um, but in an unverified state on this. So there's additional time there, but those time comes with some conditions. And now let's go forward and I'll go through some of those conditions. So for the majority, for, so where the stir shaken obligation applies um, to originating carriers, to terminating carriers, and to intermediate carriers, um, these are the obligations. So the main obligation for originating carriers and terminating carriers is to authenticate and verify SIP calls that are both originated and terminated on net. So if it's a, a purely internal on net call um, and it's done through IP, that has to be authenticated. Um, sep secondly, on the originating side, SIP calls that are originated and handed off in IP to other providers need to be authenticated so at the terminating end they can be validated. And um, conversely then for the terminating carriers, the SIP calls need to be verified before they're terminated to the end user so you get the, the benefit of the system. The intermediate providers in the second order, the FCC extended the obligation to them, um, and they generally speaking have an obligation to pass through the authentication information. So if you're an originating carrier and you hand it off to an intermediate carrier, they have to pass through whatever authentication information you have supplied. They can't alter it, they can't truncate it, um, except in very narrow circumstances. And importantly, if you send them an unauthenticated call, they are now supposed to authenticate that call. Um, and that is likely to be authenticated with a, a lower level of authentication, just sort of a gateway authentication saying, I got it, this is where it's coming from, um, without subscriber information uh, verified or the number verified. Okay, if we can then move on. Um, so, those are the rules they it applies to the ip portions of the network now not everybody's network is ip and even among those carriers who have an ip network not the entire network is it and the fcc knows that um, and so it has adopted a rule here um, really designed to push you to move towards an ip upgrade as quickly as possible so by that june 30th of 2021 deadline um, for the non-IP portion of the network, the requirement is that you, the carrier either upgrade the network to IP or be participating in the development of a call authentication standard for those TDM calls. And that participation can be direct or indirect. So um, it can be through a trade association like CCA. If CCA is participating in the efforts, that will count um, for the company as well. Now, the condition for this extension, though, is that those non-IP calls, while this new authentication is being addressed, have to be subjected to a robocall mitigation program. And I'll go in in a, in a minute to what that is. Um, but um, so those, that's the condition to it. You still have to do something to try to protect against unlawful robocalls, even in the TDM portion of your network. 
Uh, by and large, though, I will say I think what the FCC wants, and I think the better strategy, the better long-term strategy, is try to upgrade to IP interconnection wherever possible. That will give the greatest protection um, and will provide you with a um, authentication that fits what the industry is looking for. Now, if we can move on, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what the robocall mitigation program um, contains. And here I want to point out two things. Number one, it does apply in that non-IP situation. The robocall mitigation, number two, though, also applies if you're a smaller carrier and you have this two-year extension. You have to be doing something in the interim to try to protect against unlawful robocalls. And what the FCC did is they identified three elements to it, but left a lot of discretion to the carriers as to how to implement those. Um, the main and the, the central part of this is that you have to be taking reasonable steps to avoid originating illegal robocall traffic. And there's a, a number of sort of elements with, within that piece of it. Um, but you'll have to do that and you'll have to explain what those elements are. Um, you also have an obligation to commit to respond to the industry traceback group. That's the ITG on this slide. Um, their, their request for tracing back the origin of the call you do have to respond to that, do have to participate in that system. That has been very effective in the FCC's view in identifying the source of calls and enabling them to engage in enforcement activities, either fines or the more recent statement saying, um, you know, block this particular entity or be blocked yourself from uh, receiving, from sending calls. And then the third thing is that in addition to responding to those requests, the entity has to com commit to cooperate in investigating and stopping those illegal, illegal robocallers. So if the FCC does come knocking on your door and say you've got an illegal robocaller, you have to take efforts to stop that. Now, the FCC did not identify what steps specifically need to be addressed in a robocall mitigation activity. There are some elements you would expect, knowing your customer, understanding your traffic, um, gathering information. The, uh, the U.S. Telecom had put forth some factors, and the FCC looked at those and said, yeah, well, we're not going to mandate those. Um, you can certainly take it, those into account if you want. Um, they also said this, a similar thing about um, reasonable call analytics. They recognized the value of call analytics. Um, and recognize that it would be a, a, an important input, um, but the commission did not want to take a step right now as to saying what would be sufficient or what wouldn't be sufficient. So you'll have to generate something, and I know Lavinia will talk a little bit more about what um, you know robocall mitigation might look to. Now if we can move on, I've got um, just two more slides here, and then I'll be able to, to pass it along. Uh, in order to move this forward, the FCC is also adopting a new certification requirement. So um, similar to what you are uh, already have to do under CPNI, for example, um, you will need to um, provide a certification that would be an officer level certification. Um, the compliance date is to be determined yet because the FCC um, First, does not have the record keeping requirement um, approval yet. This has to go through uh, the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act and be approved by Office of Management and Budget. So that will happen at some point. And then the FCC has to stand up what the certification is. But the way they've set it up, it has very significant components. Because first, there is a, a substantive requirement in the certification if Stir shaken is not fully implemented for whatever reason. You have an extension, it's the non-IP portion of your network, you can't get SPC tokens, um, whatever the reason is that the commission has uh, established for exemptions, um, you have to explain what exemption you're under, the specific steps that you're taking in your robocall mitigation program, 
and you have to affirmatively commit to the things you had to commit to to respond to the trace back and to cooperate. Um, this comes with a very large stick, um, which is that 90 days after this certification is required, uh, carriers, intermediate carriers, will be prohibited from passing traffic that they receive from providers that fail to certify. Um, and that's, that's going to be very, very significant. That is something that has some pushback on it. I frankly suspect that it may change a little bit, um, but the FCC has been pretty serious about saying we want everybody to be doing their part in addressing robocalls. And so therefore, um, this certification requirement is going to have some teeth. I don't know if they'll be as sharp as um, what's laid out in the order right now or if that will be softened in the next few months, but I just want to highlight how important that is. Um, and then lastly, we'll move on. There are a couple of other open issues um, that are moving forward here that you should know about. They're not strictly uh, stir-shaken implementation issues, but they are um, related to it. First of all, the FCC, also in compliance with the Trace Act, had asked the North American Numbering Council to recommend industry best practices for how to authenticate calls. Um, that has been presented to the FCC. The FCC did put it out for public comment. It took comment in October. That's not been finalized yet. So if you want to comment on what that would look like, um, I encourage you to look at those best practices and compare it to what you're capable of doing in identifying your calls. Um, for those of you who operate international gateways, there are some uh, some issues still to be determined. Uh, the SPC tokens and, and the ability to get the tokens. Many gateways uh, don't assign numbers, don't have a need to assign numbers. And if you don't assign numbers, you can't get a, these tokens um, to certify the call. So that's that's been a problem. Um, and then the international standards are under development, but they're not necessarily consistent with the FCC stir shaken approach. So Canada has a stir shaken version. Um, Europe is addressing a, a Vines, uh, their GSMA is, is developing a Vines uh, related certification. So those differences still need to be worked out and how you authenticate across those, those types of networks will still be decided uh, eventually. Um, and then, um, you know, this is the restriction on the acceptance of calls here. I just wanted, important enough, I want to emphasize it again. Um, particularly, this might be an issue, uh, foreign service providers who the FCC doesn't have direct um, uh, direct authority over, the FCC is trying to find a way to encourage them to participate too and um, to file this certification on that. So, like I said, there will be teeth to this if you don't have a robocall mitigation program or if you don't certify to it and to its elements, um, blocking of traffic is certainly possible. So I will leave it there um, as the overview. I'll let Lavinia talk a little bit about um, how you might address some of these problems and then we're certainly willing to take questions that you have about the requirements. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, so there, there are four things. Let me see if I can change this. Um, there are four things that Steve mentioned that I like to focus on. Um, so, so this, this um, half, um, um, pre the, the later half of the presentation will be a, a product overview. I want to show you um, the products that we have in the market today that that will help comply with these FCC orders. Um, but, but there are four things that I'm going to address. One is um, what can a provider do, a provider that has IP in their network, how do they get on StirShaken and fully deploy that on their networks? For those uh, providers that have parts of their networks that are non-IP, um, you know, how do you participate in the, in the development of this uh, call authentication standards? Um, how do you deploy a solution, a robocall mitigation um, solution, and we can help you define that strategy. And lastly, um, how do you upgrade to IP interconnect wherever possible? Um, so, so some of the questions that come to mind 
um, would be, you know, have I implemented a call authentication framework? Um, do I have a robocall mitigation strategy for non-IP portions of my network? And um, am I going after bad actors that are initiating calls on my network? So hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll have answer to, answers to all these questions um, and give you some more information on how, um, how you get there. Um, so so the, the um, TNS has a product suite when it comes to robocall mitigation. We have um, a variety of services that protect um, your networks and your subscribers. And we always talk about a layered approach in fighting illegal and unwanted robocalls. Um, you know, the services that you see here on the slide are all in production today. And we have carriers, um, you know, large carriers like Verizon, Sprint, US Cellular, Ceasefire, um, some of the providers that use our services, as well as very small providers, providers that have under 50,000 um, subscribers and, and even less than that. Um, and what are they looking for? So, so um, to have a robocall mitigation program, you can do multiple things. You can do um, all of the things that you see on the screen, or you can do some of them. So, um, you know, universal call blocking. So we offer a service where you can block bad actors. Um, you can see the data on the, you know, we can obviously block them on the termination um, side, but you can also see the data and how it, it impacts the origination. Um, we provide advice to risk, which is a feature that will allow you to alert your subscribers for the calls that you don't want to block. You want to let the subscriber know um, that, that this could be a bad call. Um, deployment of Stir Shaken via the, the Call Guardian Authentication Hub. It's a product that we have deployed in the market today. It's in a hosted environment. And what it does is you can um, use Stir Shaken to sign and verify the calls. Um, um, we have a partnership with MetaSwitch, and that's they've been approved as, as an STICA. So we can generate the certificates. Um, we offer universal call blocking, advanced call treatment. So if you wanted to not block the call, but send it to voicemail, um, um, you can do that. Um, so so the, the Call Guardian Authentication Hub really is a one-stop shop. We've integrated um, the MetaSwitch Q call with the Call Guardian um, robocall mitigation products, um, and we offer that in a hosted environment. We also offer IPX voice transit. So this will help you um, expand the, um, the, your IP interconnect, um, you know, and, and you can deploy Stir Shaken um, faster. Um, we, we also have a mobile app that um, you can deploy and provide um, an enhanced experience for, for your customers, giving the, the, the subscriber the ability to, to block a call or, um, or have different preferences on how they want to treat that call. Um, and lastly, you know, we, we also have um, a platform that allows you to, your subscribers to interact with you. You can display a name, you can display a logo, you can display the, um, the intent of the call. Um, so let me go through some of these products in detail. Um, one of them is universal call blocking. So what do we do here? We um, block the FCC uh, permissible calls. These are the high risk calls that terminate on your network. The call does not reach the subscriber. You also have the choice here. If you want to redirect the voicemail instead, um, you can. Um, we have network integration with a TAS, with a CF, um, CSCF. Um, and what we would do here is we would work with you and analyze your high risk traffic and discuss between you know, TNS and your regulatory team, what are the um, appropriate blocking requirements? We have a flexible system, so, so we have a dial, so we can allow you to block more or block less, depending on, on what you want to do and how you want to implement um, the market, uh, how you want to implement the product. Advisor risk is another, um, another feature I mentioned. So, so, so this is, um, whether you have a mobile app or not, we can, um, we can integrate with you to um, alert the subscribers. Um, we can also layer in stir shaken inputs. This is already um, implemented in our system. So if you decided to start with a basic call block, um, uh, you know, for your uh, non-IP portions of the network, 
once your net networks are upgraded, we can um, deploy Stir Shaken, and these inputs from Stir Shaken are already built into the product, so you can display this to your subscribers. And what I'm talking about is, you know, um, a display that says this call has been authenticated. Um, uh, and you can also provide um, more information on the intent of the call um, to the subscriber. Um, we would jointly determine how the mapping works. So you can say, okay, for these types of calls, I want to display this, this category, or I want to display this name. For this type of call, I want to block. Uh, for this type of call, I want to direct to voicemail. So, um, so these products kind of works, kind of works together to, to give you the experience that you want um, and protect your network as well as your, um, your subscribers. Um, so we talked about Stir Shaken. So, so the goal of Stir Shaken is really to ensure trust in, in caller ID and traceability. Um, and um, so what, it, what is Stir Shaken? It's the ability to authenticate and verify um, a call um, using the SDI CA approved certificates. Um, Stir Shaken does not work over TDM, but, but, um, but analytics do. So, um, and I think this is one of the things that the FCC is looking to, to um, providers to show that they have other ways to protect the subscribers, even if Stir Shaken is not yet um, available. So how does Thurshaken work? Well, so the caller ID is signed by the originating service provider. The caller ID is verified by the terminating service provider. Um, we talk a lot about trust and traceability. In Thurshaken, um, trust, you know, we, we have the attestation and the verification status, and the origination ID gives us the traceability. Um, this is a plug and play development with MetaSwitch CSF. We have the Perimeter SVC, Ericsson CSCF, and, and the Ribbon PSX. These are the um, um, these these are the the integration points that we have today. Um, we also offer to to any provider a free Stir Shaken trial. So anytime you can sign up and you can test not only Stir Shaken but you can also test our robocall mitigation programs. Um, and and really, uh, we we have um, we have a web portal and we have reports that provide a window into real time network activity. You can see which calls are identified as spam. You can um, look at traffic, uh, you know, patterns. You can see um, reputation history for a particular telephone number. Um, it, it provides a lot of information on IP sources and how you trace back um, bad actors. Um, and it's very easy to generate reports for, um, you know, executives or for the FCC. Okay, um, the next um, product I'm going to talk about is Voice IPX and how that connects to our Call Guardian Authentication Hub. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, we provided a hosted, a true one-stop shop for um, not only call authentication, call analytics, but also voice IPX, which again, it, it will allow you to interconnect um, the IP and, 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 you know, speed up the process of, um, of getting Stir Shaken deployed. Um, I think I mentioned before, uh, the, you know, the, we, we have partnered with Metaswitch and we use their product QCall, so that's integrated within our environment to provide the Stir Shaken functionality. Um, and also, once you're part of the Call Guardian Authentication Hub, you would have access to all the other providers that we um, signed up on that platform and we authenticate and verify calls for, for um, as well as any other interconnect partners that we have. Okay. Um, so I have three more slides. Um, the last two are a conclusion, but I wanted to show you a little bit about um, you know, one view of, of YTNS. So, you know, the, the engine behind all of this um, is our Call Guardian product, which has uh, various data sources from various um, industry databases. We have crowdsourced feedback that we get from, um, from, from enterprises, from subscribers, um, from the mobile app. Um, we have carrier partner data. Um, we, we have stir shaken inputs and we have enterprise data. So all of that combined um, goes into our data engine and our data engine has a machine learning algorithm behind, behind it that determines um, how to treat and how to um, 
um, label label the calls. I mean, is this call a spam? Is it um, is it um, is it a call that we just apply CNAM and 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 deliver that to the subscriber? Um, in addition, we layered in stir shaken, as you know, um, and so and so it truly is a one stop shop to to get not only the calls authenticated but layer in the analytics um, and, and the robocall mitigation plans. And then if you have the mobile app or you have a way to display information to the subscriber, we can help influence display and make that a better experience for your subscribers. Um, and, and all of this can be viewed in, in our um, Call Guardian portal um, that has information um, about the scoring of the numbers as well as uh, the stir shaking um, uh, parameters and influence on scoring. So, so um, Steve talked about the Trace Act requirements. Um, there, there's three things that I want to leave you with. So, so one of them is implementing um, a, a call authentication framework on the IP portions of your network. Um, again, the Call Guardian Authentication Hub is something that's hosted. Um, it provides Star Shaken, um, Metis, which is an approved STICA, so you can get the certificates. We offer universal call blocking, any kind of advanced call treatment. Um, advice the risk to your consumers. It has a web portal and you have access to a bunch of reports and we can also build custom reports. Um, you know, we can also deploy Star Shaken in network. Um, so some of the large providers have that um, deployment model where they have Call Guardian and, um, um, and Star Shaken in, in network. Um, but but this this really focuses on the hosted environment because that's where we have all the layers that you you would need um, and they're all integrated. The second piece is implementing the robocall mitigation plan for the non-IP portions of the network. So the FCC recommends the use of reasonable analytics. Um, you know you can also have um, in addition to the Call Guardian authentication hub, um, which again focuses on termination. But a lot of that data can be used to derive what's happening on the origination. So, you know, by having access to the portal, by having access to all our reports, by having access to our resources that can help you look at your network traffic and provide analysis, we can create um, what the FCC needs to, to, to show that you are protecting your network and your subscriber, um, subscribers from, um, from illegal robocalls. Um, and number three, the monitor and act when bad subscribers initiate traffic on your network. Again, um, our reports and our analysis will help you with that. Um, participation in the industry trade, but traceback efforts is, is, is important and it's one of the requirements that the FCC uh, put forth. And then implementing a know your customer process. Um, these are some of the things that you can do um, to, to satisfy the FCC requirements. And, and lastly, um, I wanted to give an example on, on, on what you can do next. So, so again, despite the limitations, um, the FCC mandated that Stir Shake and Call Authentication Framework is, is, de is deployed and, and it cannot be avoided. Um, you know, TNS and MetaSwitch can, can certainly help you understand Stir Shake and how it applies to your network. Um, and we can walk you through some of the implementations we have in the market today. Um, as, as an example, um, stir shaken is not a silver bullet. So a layered approach will be needed, um, even for folks to say, you know, I'm going to do the minimum possible. I'm only going to deploy stir shaken. I don't need anything else. Um, most of most of the service providers that have started with stir shaken, they're now going back to say, okay, well, how do I show uh, consumers that I'm doing something? How do I show the FCC that I'm doing something? Um, and um, and again, analytics helps with that. It's 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 the other layer that um, that you can you can um, add to your network. Um, so so what can you do? So so first of all, you can connect your SBC. Obviously, our product is called Guardian Authentication Hub. You can make some test calls through. Um, you can talk to your upstream uh, SIP interconnect pro providers about your partners. You can map out the different call types um, that leave and, and enter your network. Um, and then we can look at all these individual call types and, you know, of course, start simple in the beginning, but later you would, you would layer on other call flows until, until you're comfortable um, with, with how stir shaken works. And then, 
you know, eventually layer on the analytics, um, we can help you determine intent of the call. We can provide a spam or a risk indicator. Um, and ultimately, you will want to show something to your subscriber. You will want to show some kind of a, um, advice the risk indicator to say this is potential spam, this is a scam, this is a robocaller. Um, and at some point, um, you would want to show a brand or a logo and you can you can trust that brand and logo because it has been um, sort of shaken authenticated. The analytics have been um, have been layered in and applied as well, um, and you have the confidence to display more than just um, you know a name or um, or, or um, a risk uh, indicator. So um, I think this concludes my presentation. I'm going to turn it over to back to you. Great, thank you both very much. Um, now we're gonna turn to the Q&A portion of our uh, webinar. We've had a bunch of questions come in, so we will jump right in. Um, the first question, as a small carrier, what is the process to apply for the extension? Yeah, I, and I'll take that one, Lucy. It's actually, it's a very good question. Um, the process was one of the issues the FCC was looking at in this most recent order. It decided to adopt a blanket extension for all small carriers. So if you are below the threshold, the 100,000 line threshold, the extension, the deadline is automatically extended for the IP portion of your network until June 30th of 2023. The FCC, I'll, I'll add a couple things on that. The FCC did say that um, it will consider um, petitions for ex further extensions. Um, it suggested those should be come in by November 20th. So if for some reason 2023 doesn't work, you could file a petition for a further extension. Um, there are three smaller extensions that I didn't mention explicitly, but I'll throw in here um, just so you know about them and if you need an extension from those. Um, voice service providers that can't get that SPC token, as I mentioned in the context of the International Gateway, they're automatically given an extension, and until they're that extension is until they're able to get to get that token. Um, services that are subject to Section 214 discontinuance um, notices when June 30th, 2021 comes around, those are automatically extended for up to a year. And then the non-IP network is extended, but again subject to that um, that the requirements of section 64 63303 which is the um the uh the upgrade or participate in the standard development so those extensions also apply and they also apply automatically anything that's outside of those the fcc is asking to come by november 20th uh, so just you know a few weeks away great thank you our next question what is the deadline for certification attestation for robocall blocking? Is that June 30th, 2021, or it is a win or is it a window after the implementation deadline? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's a good question. So there's there's two things. So the deadline for the certification of your compliance with the rules and description of what your robocall mitigation uh, process is that has not been determined yet. Uh, the, as I said, the FCC needs to get approval for that, and they need to stand up the database on that. So we don't know. I presume they're trying to do that as quickly as possible, presumably before June 30th, um, but there's no guarantee on that. Um, with respect to call blocking, I just wanted to emphasize blocking itself, which is one of the things that is powered by what by um, by TNS's products uh, on the on your terminating call side of it. That's not mandatory, but the FCC has adopted safe harbors to try to encourage providers to uh, participate in that process. Great, thanks. Next question, uh, does the TNS Call Guardian product satisfy the requirement to avoid originating illegal robocall traffic? Um, I'll, I'll take that, Lucy. Um, so, so, so it so it does. Um, I mean, Call Guardian um, is deployed prim primarily on the termination side, but like I said, there there are lots of reports and network traffic analysis that we can provide. Um, now, 
if somebody were to deploy call guardian on origination, you can block calls as well. I'm just not sure that that's something you would want to do. You would probably want to start by looking at what types of calls and why and, and do a bit of research. So we don't have anyone today blocking on origination. But certainly um, we have the data and the reports to help you understand why that traffic is bad um, and what we can do about it to, to avoid to avoid it. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question, are there going to be any subsidies for smaller providers considering the cost without being able to charge customers for the service? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Lucy. Um, so there's nothing in the Trace Act that provides any kind of subsidy for for that. Um, so it, it's not clear to me um, that there will be anything. That there hasn't been any discussion of that that I have seen. Um, if you're receiving other subsidies, um, they, I would encourage you to check to see whether you know your um, universal service subsidies are can be used for this purpose my off the top of my head guess is going to be yes but you really need to look closely and decide great thanks um another question um i think this one's for you lavinia how does your service differentiate from others Yeah, so I mean, um, we have we have multiple differentiators. One that I um, that I can mention is is the fact that we have everything in one place. So the Call Guardian Authentication Hub offers that in a hosted environment. Um, another differentiator is that we have um, a very powerful analytics engine, um, and um, you know, again, deployed at tier one customers as well as um, smaller providers. Um, we also have, um, you know, the a la carte menu. You can you can decide you want to start with one thing. You can just start with Stir Shaken or start with call blocking first, and then layer layer on other services. So it's it's very scalable. Um, we also have a robust environment where you can test and trial um, um, our products and um, um, and deploy very quickly. Great, thanks. Um, another question. If the call comes in from our interlauded tandems from Verizon, let's say, but they get delivered to our immediate IP and then we get the call with IP, this call is coming in to terminate to our mobile customer. What do we do then as we do not control the originating call from Verizon, but we but our intermediate provider converts that to SIP and sends it to us? Yeah, yeah. You know, Lucy, there are going to be a lot of these types of call scenarios, particularly at the beginning, as you have have these exemptions. So the in the the hypothetical, the call would originate without um, without any authentication. So in a in a non SIP environment, um, under the rules here, when it hits that intermediate provider who converts it to SIP. Um, that would likely be authenticated there and would receive that lower gateway attestation there because that provider can simply say, I got it, but I don't know anything about the originating um, caller or about the originating number. And then that would be passed through the rest of the way. So the, the terminating carrier would get it with that um, lower attestation on it and would deliver it to the customer um, with whatever information you place um, according to that at level of attestation. Ultimately, the goal is to get everything up to the fully authenticated uh, level, but that's going to require more protocols, um, more of those best practices about how to authenticate, and more of the originating points to be uh, in SIP so that they're subject to the authentication framework. Great, thanks. Um, I think we have time for just one final question. So last question, if a carrier identifies a bad actor, is it required to accuse the actor or deal with it directly? Or should the FCC or other authorities authorities be uh, be notified? Excuse me. Okay, um, th this is where as a lawyer, I get to say it depends, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the answer to that question is, as I said, 
in the certification part, every provider will have to adopt a robocall mitigation program. And part of that mitigation program is what are your practice and procedures to avoid originating illegal calls? Um, and uh, what I didn't emphasize there is that the FCC has said you have to actually follow that mitigation program. So whatever you say, you have to do, which opens up a potential enforcement aspect from the FCC side. So um, however you write your policies for once you identify a bad actor and what you're going to do, that would dictate this, the answer to this specific question. Um, but, uh, you know, the broader policy, I will say, is that the FCC is really trying to root out these bad actors um, in order to restore trust in the voice calling system. So I think the FCC is going to want um, those originating carriers to do something to block or prevent that entity from originating more illegal calls. Great, thank you. Um, well, before we close things out, uh, Lavinia, Steve, do you have any final thoughts to share? No, I think I'm good. Thank you so much for, for inviting um, us and for spending 45 minutes um, with us today. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I, I too want to say thank you. you know, this is a, a developing area. I think things will continue to develop. Um, I, I'm sure CCA will continue to give you um, advice and information on that, but um, but watch this as it moves forward, particularly on that area where I talked about how sharp the teeth are going to be in the certification. But thanks again. Great. Thank you both very much for uh, being with us here this afternoon, and um, that concludes our webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.